Hello again everyone, and welcome back. My name is Bonehead, and originally I had planned this intro in Spanish. I was going to read it out loud in Spanish and have English subtitles at the bottom. I was going to poke fun at my Spanish and how poor it was. But there's just one issue. My Spanish pronunciation is embarrassingly poor. And I'm too lazy to actually do the subtitles. It's just typical me, really. But today I wanted to talk about another of my favourite games. A true classic. A staple in the survival horror genre. And it's one that needs no introduction. It is Resident Evil 4. Not much can be said about Resident Evil 4 that hasn't already. The game is a masterpiece in the eyes of anyone who plays it, and frequently tops most top 10 games lists. And I'm talking from personal experience, so you can trust me. I just winked, but you can't see it. <laughs> so that was pointless. <laughs> This game redefined what it meant to be a third-person shooter in the mid-2000s, and many games after it tried to copy its formula and cash in on its success. It revolutionised the over-the-shoulder aiming mechanic, and while it wasn't the first game to introduce quick-time events, it definitely brought them to the limelight, with almost everyone else in game development afterwards putting them in their own games. You couldn't play like 90% of most games after 2005 without some kind of quick-time event in it, and really that's the only negative thing Thing I personally think Resident Evil 4 introduced. Resident Evil 4 was initially released for the Nintendo GameCube on January 11th 2005 in North America, January 27th for Japan, and March 18th for the good old U of K in Europe. Apparently we must have said something mean about Japan's mum, because we never could get games before or around the same time as anyone else in the world back in the day. Thank god global releases are normal now for the most part anyway. Upon its release, Resident Evil 4 swept the board both critically and commercially, getting 9s and 10s across an ocean of reviews, with the lowest score at the time being a 9.6 from GameSpot according to Wikipedia. Even to this day, after being ported to almost every console, it still gets perfect scores, currently rated 29th best game of all time on Metacritic with a score of 96 from critics and a 9.2 from user scores. Now, just like in my Majora's Mars video, I do want to start this off by saying I'm not a reviewer in any sort, and most of what I say will probably be nonsense. But this video is just a reason for me to get to talk about my favourite game in the Resident Evil series, and one of my favourite games of all time. Taking place six years after the Raccoon City incident, which ended in a nuclear reboot, we follow one Leon S. Kennedy, a once rookie cop who survived the zombie apocalypse and is now a hard-ass secret service agent working directly for the President of the United States of America, and he was tasked with watching over and protecting his daughter, Ashley Graham. It doesn't go so well though. One day, on her way home from college, good boy and beret enthusiast Jack Krauser offers Ashley a lift home, but lol jokes, he actually takes her to central Spain and delivers her to a local local cult with a parasite fetish. They want to infect Ashley so she can go back home, but infect senior president and take over the world. Of course! Leon, being the brave boy he is, gets an Uber to Spain and proceeds to inquire about Ashley's location from a local yokel who only speaks in accents. I'm not apologising. And after killing the man in cold blood and causing minor property damage, Leon stumbles across the small settlement of El Pueblo Village, which my Spanish girlfriend had pointed out to me that Pueblo in Spanish means village. Leon goes to the village village, or the village of village if you prefer, getting ambushed by the local fodder enemy called Ganados. Leon is chased into a house in which he barricades himself and sees there's a chainsaw surgeon known as Dr. Salvador on his way. He decides a shotgun is the best home remedy for a parasitic infection and fights the seemingly endless supply of the same five guys. Eventually, La Campana rings out and everyone just leaves Leon on his lonesome cracking wise. Where's everyone going? Bingo? But really, I think he's worried about missing out on those sweet bingo prizes. But nevertheless, a new nightmare has now begun with Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil 4 is mindless good fun. It's campy, over the top, and self-aware. And even if you've never played this, you probably knew that anyway, because everyone and their nan has described it this way. Because it really is the best way to describe it in so many words. 
The introduction to the game with the village ambush is not only a great set piece, but a great taster for the kind of encounters you're going to have throughout the rest of the game. It's tense and overwhelmingly stressful, especially for the new players who probably went in expecting shambling zombies again. The Ganados are infected with a parasite called Las Plagas, and from this infection they are faster and smarter than any zombie Leon would have faced before. They can bum rush you, use weapons like pitchforks and hatchets, and javelin those suckers at you like it's the goddamn Spanish Olympics. They can even trap and surround you. It's a mob mentality here, a hive mind for evil farmers, and it's terrifying. Even the introduction of Dr. Salvador is no joke. He isn't just there to make the cutscene more pant-shittingly nerve-wracking. He will chase you down, and he will remove your cabeza from your cuello. Now I know I joked about the fact that the basic village ganados only come in five flavours, but really the opposing force of this game is really quite varied. The Ganados themselves range from basic farmer man and homicidal chainsaw twins to, to robed cultists slinging agricultural equipment at you, and even a severely under-equipped militia rolling with cattle prods and crossbows. It wouldn't be a Resident Evil game without body horror and literal nightmare fuel. For example, if a Ganado has red eyes, upon death, the parasite inside them will gush out from their neck hole and become a gross tentacle packing razor sharp bone sickles to attack you, or they'll become this horrible little face hugger thing that scurries around the place and jumps at you. On a side tangent here before I carry on, there is one enemy in the game, a dog type enemy called Colmios, which is the Spanish word for fangs, but I can't help but feel like this was a missed opportunity and they should have called them lobos instead. Lobos literally means wolves in Spanish. Maybe Maybe it's too obvious, but I think it makes more sense than fangs, considering how most of the creatures in this game have fangs. Novista doors are big old buggy boys that can turn invisible and force feed Leon vomit. Garadors are big blind Wolverine cosplayers, and Regenerators are just pure nightmare fuel that can just swallow a dick made of sandpaper for all I care. The bosses are pretty sweet though. El Gigante, Del Lago, and Bono's lesser known band U3 rounds out the purely mutated boss fights, while Bitores Mendez, Ramon Salazar, Jack Krauser, and Osman Sadler make up the list of bosses that go from human to no thank you in zero seconds flat. I would say Verdugo is a boss, but he's really not. Just run down the hall into a room with a liquid nitrogen tank, tip over said tank, pull out a rocket launcher or a grenade, and you're done in just three easy steps. Killing these enemies wouldn't be fun if Resident Evil 4 didn't have great controls and mechanics. And obviously they do, otherwise I wouldn't have mentioned it and we wouldn't be here. But there you go. Resident Evil 4 retains the tank controls from previous games, and also like the previous games, readying your weapon plants you on the spot, forcing you to remain stationary to shoot, which adds a whole other level of tension, as this game does want to make sure you never have full control of any given situation. There's no crosshairs either for you to aim your weapon, just a laser sight with a single red dot to let you know where you're aiming. I think it's pretty cool. And while the aiming with a controller is a little finicky at times, the Wii version of Resident Evil 4 is the definitive control scheme in my opinion for these games. Also one small thing I do absolutely love and will never get tired of is critical hitting enemies. One well placed shot and you reduce the head of whoever stands before you into raspberry jam. And let's not forget every OCD's wet dream the attaché case. The best inventory a game has ever had in my opinion. A place for everything and everything in its place. Everyone has their own layout when it comes to the attaché case. And some people go as far as to cry heresy if they see someone else's attaché case set up in any way slightly different. They call blasphemy and seek penance from these sinners who have defiled the will of the Lord of portable storage. Coming away from where we put the things, and talking about where we put the Leon. The locations are very different and unique against each other. Obviously you start in Village Village, and then your journey takes you to an impossibly large gothic castle. I mean, just look at this skybox. There's no way a castle this big exists. And trust me, I checked. I googled it. There are castles in central Spain whose architecture obviously inspired Salazar's castle, but for the size they're showing here, especially for the castle grounds, just doesn't fly. It makes Hogwarts and Dracula's castle look like a small bungalow up in Shepherd's Bush. It just doesn't make sense. And the final location is Sadler's very own industrial military island. And it is my least favourite of the three. I get the theme is meant to be very metallic and bleak, but it bores me. And it's the one area I tend to rush through the most. The village is still my favourite, I think. I like the tone it's set, 
I like the rustic feel of it all. I like the fact that it doesn't feel like they ever left the 17th century either. I like how everything feels wholesome and hobbled together by a small community, and you can tell before this whole last Plagas ordeal broke out. These people were peaceful. They just went around their lives. They were farmers. They were carpenters, midwives. And people were also very quick to point out there's no children in this game. As you find out through text in game that while the villagers were being injected with Las Plagas, the children's bodies couldn't handle the stress from the changes and ultimately the Plagas killed them. There is one other mystery within Resident Evil 4 that still hasn't been solved to this very day. A mystery that keeps even the most hardened scholars up at night. The true identity and nature behind the one, the only, merchant. Oh, I'll kill you. No one truly knows where he comes from, who he is, or where he fits in in the larger narrative of Resident Evil 4. Is he a part of Los Illuminados? I mean, he doesn't have a Spanish accent, yet he does have glowing red eyes, which suggests infection at the very least. But then he is also supplying a buttload of heavy munitions to Leon in his fight against Sadler and his men, which does really skew that notion. Does he hold a grudge? Is he just trying to profit from the one-man massacre of this surprisingly populated cult? How does he get to all these places he sets up in before Leon arrives, especially when there's usually a very elaborate door or obstacle to block the path? Is there more than one of them? Because if you kill him in one location, he appears in another. These are the questions I believe once we answer, we would have solved the true meaning of life and gained access to immortality and to ascend to the higher planes of existence. Or not. I'm just really curious. Resident Evil 4 is a good time. Just plain and simple. It's got really tight gameplay and gunplay. The enemies are varied enough and plentiful enough that you don't get bored mowing them down, and the quieter moments that are set aside for exploration are refreshing in a good way, but are also there to build suspense. And it all ties back to just how cool and badass our boy Skinetti here is. Busting out one-liners and striking poses that looks like he's doing a photo shoot for GQ. It's goofy over-the-top goodness that people really should experience, especially if current rumours are to be believed that they are remaking this game. And while that does excite me, it scares me as well because there is a very good chance that they might end up changing too much and ruin the game. There's talk that they're thinking about adding either new chapters or story points, and as long as they only serve to expand and enrich the experience instead of adding extra gameplay sections that really don't need to be there, I'm fairly confident in saying that Capcom, especially modern Capcom, probably isn't stupid enough to go out of their way to ruin what is essentially their flagship game. But I think that's enough from me today. I've been Bonehead, and thank you for watching.